But grab your Bibles and go with me. We have a word from the Lord, and I'm so excited about the privilege of preaching it on today. It's going to minister to the heart of needs. It's going to meet us in our households. It's going to meet us right where we live. Turn with me to Isaiah 40, verse 28 is where we'll start, and we'll conclude maybe around verse 31. Go to Isaiah, the 40th chapter. We'll start at the 28th verse. I know... I know it's familiar. I know you probably can quote it without even having to look at the text, but I want us to read it together. So Isaiah, the 40th chapter, verse 28. Come on. I see y'all victory walkers everywhere. I love y'all so much. Isaiah 40 and 28. And I love this church. Let me tell you why I love this church so much, because y'all love the word. You love worship. You love praise. We can shout with the best of them. We got a sign in the lobby. Caution, we'll shout. But I love it because you shout just as hard and you're so intensely focused on the truth of what God has spoken, his holy word, that that's the priority. That's the primary focus. And you like meat. And that makes me excited because it makes me work and dig into the treasure of his word to pull out nuggets that will breathe life into dead situations. This is our moment. This is our time. Isaiah 40 and 28. I won't be here long, um, but... I hope that it's powerful and effective what God has given me to give to you. Isaiah 40, 28, it reads as follows. Read along with me. It says, I'm reading from the New International Version. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting, the Lord is everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. And he will not grow tired or weary. And his understanding, no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak and even the youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall but those who hope in the Lord I know you know the King James Version but they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength they will soar on wings like eagles they will run and not get weary they will walk and not faint they that wait upon the Lord. How many of you have been waiting? Then I brought you encouragement. You will run and not get weary. Come on. You got encouragement. You about to mount up with wings like eagles. God's about to take you to new heights. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. If you've been waiting, then God says this is the moment I'm about to blow your mind. Seasons are shifting. There's a change in the atmosphere, and he's about to do something amazing in your life. Come on, let's talk to God for a moment. God, give us grace. This is your moment. You set it up. Have your way. Use me. Speak to and through me. and Speak to your people that they would hear and receive in their hearts. And God, that it would motivate their hands and their heads to comply with your dynamic truth. Order our steps in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. And ultimately, take this moment, get the glory out of it and let it reverberate now throughout eternity that even our children and our children's children's children will be benefactors of the truth and the word and the transformative power that happens and that moves in this moment god you are so good so i don't have to wait till the battle is over i don't have to wait till i see it i can shout right now come on and just shout hallelujah Come on, I'm excited about what God is about to do and how he's going to speak to us on today. I just need you to understand, I need to get this in your spirit. And so I'm going to say this, I'm going to say this definitively, and I'm going to say it powerfully, I'm going to say it over and over again, because I think you need to understand this. I think it's, it's imperative that you take this with you. I need you to turn to people in your house. I know that you're there, they're in your house, so it's safe. We quarantine together. So uh, turn to people around you and or say it in the chat room. Whatever makes you feel better, talk to yourself. Just say, use it. Yes, use it. Very simple. Use, use it, use it. In Exodus, the 17th chapter, verses 8 through 13, I'm not going to go there for the sake of time, but in Exodus, the seventh, seventh chapter, verses 8 through 13, uh, there is the depiction of Moses uh, leading the Israelites, leading the army of God, and they were in a battle. Joshua was confronted with the, with the task of being in the battle with the Am Amalekites. And so in this particular battle, uh, there was a, a, a unique dynamic that was taking place on the mountaintop. Uh, 
As long as Moses had his arms extended, as long as he kept his arms up, his hands up, the battle was being won by the Israelites. God's people were defeating their enemies. It was only at the time that Moses' hands fell did they start to lose the battle. So the question that I have for you today is uh, if you've been feeling defeated, if you've been feeling like the weight and the pressure of the world has become so insurmountable, if you've been feeling like uh, the, 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 the enemy is, is, is so far in advance or so far ahead of you in this process that there's no way you're going to ever catch up, that he's already stolen and taken off with your stuff, that he's taken your joy, taken your peace, taken your increase, taken your, your mindset. If you still feel in this way, I, I have this question. I have this question that I want to pose to you today. And, and, and if I look at the text in Exodus and see that when Moses' hands are up, he is defeating the enemy, but as soon as they're down, until Aaron and Ur propped them up, uh, they were being defeated. So the question that I have is really simple. What makes you drop your hands? Yeah, I, I want to let that marinate for a few minutes. Let me put that in, in your spirit and just let it sit and settle. What makes you drop your hands? Is it financial frustration? Uh, is it the issues that you're having trying to deal with your crazy ex. Yeah, I just saw some of y'all shout amen right there. <laughs> is it the, the frustration over the whole COVID-19 saga? It, 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 is it the cover-to-cover -cover, uh, dynamic of disrupting our normalcy, taking away our capacity to even understand and know what's going to happen next? Is it the anxiety of trying to figure out how you're going to function and how you're going to feed your family and what does your tomorrow look like and what does your financial picture look like? What is your vocational track going to look like? How are we going to deal with school? We, we who have kids going to college, what is that going to look like? Is that, what, is that what's causing you to lose, uh, lose hope in the fight and to let your hands drop? What is causing you? What makes your hands drop? Could it be the temptation that is all around that the enemy is trying to lure you and pull you back in? Is that what makes you drop your hands? Uh, or could it be none of these things? Could it be none of the dynamics that I just alliterated for you? Could it be very simply, you're just tired? Yeah, could it be that you have become so consumed under the weight of the pressures of everyday living that it has worn you out down and ultimately worn you out until your spirit is weary, until you are just tired? And I'm not talking about the kind of tire that you can go to sleep and it'll all come back together and work out just fine. I'm not talking about the kind of tire that qualifies uh, as, as fatigue and you just uh, you get a, 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 a five hour energy drink or get a dose of your, your caffeine, your coffee in the morning. And now you got a little extra pep in your step. No, I'm talking about the tired that normal things will not fix. I'm talking about the tired that the kind of tire that qualifies to even be constituted as spiritual weariness. Weariness is to be physically mentally, emotionally exhausted to feel like there is nothing left for me to give. And with weariness, you can be there and still not be present. With weariness, you can show up and still not have anything to offer. The question is, have you grown weary? Is that what's making you now drop your hands? Uh, I, I brought... A bit of good news, and the good news is very simple. You are a part of a very unique group. Yeah, you who have grown weary, you who can be honest and say on the inside, I'm worn out. My spirit is depleted. I don't have anything. I'm showing up, but I really don't have much to offer. I want to contend and give you this bit of good news that you are a part of a unique group called humans. Yeah, let that sit in for a second. I know that may be a shock to your system, but you are not the only one that grows weary. And I don't care how saved, sanctified, fire baptized, and filled with the Holy Ghost somebody says they are. Everybody grows weary. You are a part of a very prestigious list 
of human beings who have grown weary. David got weary. Job got weary to the point that his weariness caused him to say some things to God and God turned around and spoke to him out of a whirlwind. Moses got weary. And in John 4 and 6 in his humanity, we see that even Jesus got weary. The Bible says in the text in verses 30, in verse 30, that even the youths, even the young grow tired and weary. And young men will stumble and fall. There is only one who never gets weary. So I want to give you that because sometimes we feel like we are failing or we are a failure because weariness has consumed us. But only God does not get weary. Yeah, that, that ought to put it in perspective for you. Because none of us can live up to the height of holiness that God has except through the power of his Holy Spirit and then only through Christ Jesus. But God is God all by himself. And only God does not grow weary. In the text it says the Lord is everlasting. He is the creator of the ends of the earth. And get this, very definitively, it's not, a, it's not a mystery. It's no gray area. He says he will not grow tired or weary. And so, yes, you're getting weary. Yes, there are going to be moments that weariness will consume you. But I want to give you all the incentive and motivation to break free from this place. To, to, to pull yourself out of this dynamic that, that you can come to a place where God can still get the greatest glory and usage out of your life. You've got to fight this thing, this spirit called weariness. Let me tell you why it's imperative that you do that. Because the effects of weariness can be detrimental. The effects of weariness can be, have long-term ramifications that are not positive. The effects of weary can be something that is absolutely not good. When you're weary, you make bad decisions. Yeah, no prayer, no counsel, no God. You'll just go. You'll do things that you should not be doing and take on things that you should not be taking on and be a part of things that you should not be a part of. That's why it's imperative that you rest both your body, your mind, and your spirit. That you give yourself a refreshing through the power of God's word. That you worship him and stay in his face because otherwise weariness will consume you and you will eventually start making bad decisions. Not only are bad decisions a result of weariness, but bad timing. In other words, you'll give up too early. When you become weary, that's why Galatians 6 and 9 says, be not weary in well-doing. The only reason that the spirit of weariness attacks you is because you're doing well. Be not weary in well-doing. In due season, you will reap. In due season, here's the problem. When you get weary in your well-doing, you miss due season. Your time will be right there on the brink or you'll be right there on the brink of a breakthrough. But weariness will cause you to give up, throw in the towel, walk away as if nothing is ever happening. Bad timing is a result of weariness. And it's expensive to give up too early. It costs you the most valuable thing you are in possession of. It costs you your time. <clears throat> Anything born prematurely, born out of season, runs the risk of early termination. So you got to know that fighting weariness is imperative because it will keep you from making bad decisions, having bad timing, and participating in bad behavior. Yeah, if you get weary... Weariness will cause you to self-sabotage. It'll cause things to break down in a way that they've never happened before. Weariness will cause you to do things that are out of your mind, that are out of your complete mannerism or your normal mannerism. And weariness will consume your mouth until you, you start doing things that are out of character. Weariness will cause bad behavior because you stop fighting or resisting the temptation of the enemy. So you've got to fight weariness and understand 
weariness to a degree that you know what is causing this weariness. The only way to fight something is to get a better understanding of what it is that you're fighting. If you're going to be successful at resisting weariness, you've got to be successful at understanding what it is that you're even fighting or why weariness is even a problem. The source of weariness is simple. First of all, the source of wisdom can be traced back to your perspective. It can be traced back to how you see things. Life does not make you weary. Let me be clear about that. All of the things that I alliterated or that I named at the beginning of the sermon, all the pressures and all the pains, all the problems, all the things that pop up, all the little idiosyncrasies that, that come with being alive, that's not what makes you weary. The way you handle life is what makes you weary. Yeah, you've got to get to the place where you understand this because you feel like if I fix these little things, then the spirit of weariness, will I will evade it or it will erase it from existence. No, because here's what I learned from Paul. There are some things that you're not going to be able to fix. He asked God, can you please take this thorn out of my side? God returned with a no. Why would I take it out when you're doing so well with it? It is a thing that is pushing you into my presence. It is a thing that is causing you to have a prayer life that you've never had before. It is a thing that is causing you to worship me both in spirit and in truth. It is a thing that's making you long for me. So he says, no, everything in life you will not be able to fix. Don't, start, don't, don't keep praying for things to change. But start asking God to change you so you can handle the things that you cannot change. Because I don't care who you are, how much money you have. I don't care how prominent, how prestigious. I don't care how many degrees you have on the wall. There are some things that you're not going to be able to change. Do you know how many wealthy people would have paid all of their resources and all of their wealth to save the life of someone who passed away or transitioned from the, ugly, uh, the ugliness of cancer or any other disease that had eroded or, or eroded their bodies, not even your money will be able to rescue you. You can get good care. You can see the best physicians. But if it's in the sovereign will of God, transition is inevitable. And so there are some things that you're not going to be able to change. So the only thing that you can do is ask God to change you so you can handle whatever it is you cannot change. One of the reasons that weariness is attacking you is because you've got to change your perspective. You've been currently wrestling with how to change the things, but you better start by asking God to change the person that you're looking at in the mirror. And the only thing that you have authority over, let me be clear, the only thing that you have real authority over, absolute control of, is you. If you change you, things around you will either conform, retreat, or you'll be able to walk right through them. You will retain your peace because your tolerance for certain things will change. It doesn't mean that it will always be uneasy, always be uncomfortable. You've had some good days and you've had some bad days. You've had some ups and with ups, you also know that there come some downs. There's been some sunny days and if you've lived long enough, you've had some cloudy days. Either way, what you have to do is ask God for the grace to handle whatever day you find yourself in. The spirit of weariness attacks us because he knows, the enemy knows, that if he captivates our mind, then ultimately our spirit and everything else around us or about us will eventually follow suit. So change your perspective. Let this mind be in you that is also in Christ Jesus be not conformed to the ways of the world, but be transformed, changed from the inside out by, by the renewing of your mind. Change your perspective. The other reason that weariness is attacking us or the source of weariness in our lives is that you've got to look at your pursuit. Not just your perspective, 
but you've got to pay attention to your pursuit. You've got to stop trying to figure everything out. What are you chasing after? God says, chase after me. I'll give you the desire of your heart. I'll make everything fall into place where it should be. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else. He says, I'll add it to you. What are you pursuing? Just say, I don't understand. See, here's the thing. We're pursuing our own capacity to figure everything out. News flash. I'm about to release you. I'm about to, to give you your liberty back. You are not required to figure everything out. I know that you feel like that you've got to figure everything out, have all the answers, have everything together. There are some things in this life you simply will not figure out. But that's where you have to have an extraordinary level of faith. That's where Hebrews 11 and 6 comes in. That's where faith becomes the priority and the passion of your life. God, I, I need to learn how to trust you. I need to learn how to lean and depend on you. You've got to trust in the Lord. Proverbs 3 and 5 says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Watch this. And lean not to your own understanding. You would not have so much weariness if you were not carrying so much weight because you're trying to figure everything out. Some things I may not understand, but one thing I do know for sure that whatever is going to happen, however it's happening, it's all working out according to my good. How do you know? Because God told me so. And he is truth. When he speaks, it is. When he declares, it becomes. When he, de when, he, when he puts things into the atmosphere of existence, it cannot be pulled away. It cannot be derailed. It cannot be thwarted. It cannot be diminished by anything man can do. So if God says, if I be for you, who has the audacity to stand against you? I can rest in that. That it's going to work out for my good. But God, this ain't good. Then he ain't done. It's not over. God is beyond your understanding. The way he says it is that my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As high as the heavens are from the earth, so are my ways from mankind. And his understanding no one can fathom. Read the text. It says it right here. His understanding nobody can fathom. I don't know when. I don't know what. I don't know how. But what I do know, God, is it's going to work out and it's going to work for my good. And it will be as you have declared it will be. I don't know how you're going to fix it. I don't know how you're going to put it back together again. I don't know how I'm going to see this season end. I don't know how we're going to make it through this moment. I don't know how it's going to be when I get to the other side. But as long as you're God, as long as you're seated on the throne, as long as I know you have me in the care, in the hollow of your care, and you're holding my life in your hand, then God, I know it's going to be all right. I, I love the song that we used to sing when I was growing up down south in Arkansas. I got a feeling that everything is going to be all right. Matthew 6 and 33 says, change your pursuit. Quit trying to figure everything out. Some things you're going to have to put in God's hand and say, God, I don't understand why it's happening like this. God, I don't know why I got to go through this moment like this. God, I don't know why I needed to hurt like this. God, I don't know how it's going to come together. I don't know how you're going to work it out, but I trust you. Lord, I trust that you're going to put it in the perspective that it needs to be and everything is going to work out fine you've got to trust in him you have to know that God is still God and he does not need your help listen when I was when my babies were babies and I would take them somewhere I would simply grab them by the hand and I would just lead them where I wanted them to go they didn't ask any questions it wasn't where we going how we gonna get there 
Who's going to be there? How long are we going to stay? No questions at all. The younger they were, I would just grab them and they had a blind faith. They had a confidence in me that allowed them to follow me. And it wasn't that they had confidence just in an adult because any other person could come and try to grab them or even try to hold them or pick them up and they would holler and kick and scream to get back to me. They had a confidence in me. They trusted their father. They believed that whatever I was going going to take them into was going to be something that would be all right something that would be enjoyable something that they would have joy and peace something that they could be comfortable resting it was going to be okay and so God wants us to go back to the place of our childhood except you be like these little children then you are not even fit to enter the kingdom of God he wants you to have a blind confidence the way you did when you were a babe the way you did when you were a little toddler you didn't ask any questions Questions. See, the older my kids get, the more questions they have now, the more I have to remind them, hey, just ride. Sit back and ride, Clyde. I'll get you there wherever we're going. But, Daddy, how long we going to be there until I get done? And when they come back, they always figure out that what I had in store for them was greater than what they thought they had in their own plans, in their own process. God says what I got in store for you is greater than anything that you got in your own plans. I've been waiting on you to start longing to pursue me like I've been pursuing you. I pursued you through eternity, subjected myself to time. I clothed myself in flesh and allowed myself to be hung on a cross so I could have you close to me. So if I was that good then, what makes you think I'm not going to be good now? If you who are unpure, if you who are impure give your children good gifts what makes you think that I don't have good stuff in store for you you gotta trust me I need you to get to the place where you learn not to just lean on me but I need a few of you to learn how to lay on me I need you to curl up in my lap I need you to rest and I got you no weapon formed against you shall prosper greater is he that's me that is in you than the stuff you're dealing with and I need you to trust me God says who are you pursuing weariness is attacking you because of your pursuit you have lost your capacity to seek after me. It is your perspective. It is your pursuit. But it's also your power. You've been wrestling with this thing, trying to figure it out in your own strength. But in verse 29 of the text, he says, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Helplessness is a place of power when you place it before God. Asking God for help is one of the keys to overcoming your weariness. Getting to the place where he makes you lie down in green pastures is to position you so that he can restore your soul. He wants you to start looking at him not just as God, but he wants you to start looking at him as Savior. In Hebrews 12 and 3, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. In other words, when you get powerless, he says, I need you to look at how powerful Jesus has been on your behalf. I need you to focus on the suffering that he endured for you. I need you to focus on, on the, the attacks and the weariness that attacked him that he overcame to give you confidence through him that you can overcome it too. But they that wait, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. God says, I've got strength for the weary. I'm just waiting on you to seek my power. You've been trying to work it out. You've been trying to figure it out. You've been trying to pay your way out of it. You've been trying to call your, your friends to get out of it. You've, you've been trying to come up with your own strategy. You've had your own perspective. You've been in the wrong pursuit. God says, I'm trying to position this so that you understand it's my power 
that's going to lift you up. It's my power that's going to bring you through it. It's my power that's going to get you beyond it. It's not your in your weakness. My strength is made perfect. And when you decide to rest in my power, you shall mount up with wings as eagles. You shall run and not be weary. You shall walk and not faint. He says, I am the source of your strength. And I'm just waiting on you to hold on to my power. Let me tell you, uh, he, he, I wondered why he used in his imagery, he used the analogy of the eagle. And then I did a little more discovery and study on the eagle. And I realized that the eagle doesn't get weary when the storms are coming. But an eagle gets excited because the storm is for leverage and for lifting. Everything that the eagle does in this time should be exemplary to, to what we do as believers. See, understand that he didn't just haphazardly or casually throw the eagle in just because he needed something to say. But he wanted us to pay attention to how an eagle is able to soar above its situation. They will soar on wings like eagles. Eagles use the storms for leverage and for lifting. Yeah, yeah, they're creative is good, but innovation is life changing. The storm that you're in is actually not here to consume you. But if you're like an eagle, every other bird in the animal kingdom will take cover in the midst of a storm. Every other creature will take cover in the midst of a storm. Even people begin to run and take cover when a storm is coming. But an eagle will go to the highest point it can find and it'll sit there and wait on the storm it will wait because the storm comes and as the storm approaches it lifts its wings and the atmosphere the pressure in the atmosphere will catch the wings on a down drift on a down drift and it will lift the eagle to a higher level I don't know how many eagles I'm preaching to this morning but God says spread your wings you're about to soar above the storm you're about to go above the clouds and if you watch an eagle long enough you'll see it's not messed up by the storm it simply lifts its wings and the storm raises it up so it's above the storm it's looking down on the storm while it's soaring in the sunshine I got a few eagles here this morning that came with the expectation that this storm is not for my detriment this season is not for my demise the end is not upon me but God says I'm about to give you a new thing in a new season all my eagles raise up I need some eagles to spread your wings this is not the season to get weary this is the season to birth new businesses this is not the season to get weary but this is the season to increase your study and your prayer life this is not the season to get weary because they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up on wings as eagles they shall run and not be be weary they will walk and they will not faint if you are an eagle I am talking to you this sermon is not for chickens this ain't for the rooster this ain't for the pigeon this ain't for the crow this ain't for the vulture this is for eagles but all of the eagles whatever storm you're confronting use it use it to lift you up use this season to take you to new heights use this moment to birth new innovative thoughts and creative ideas use this season to say God what you want to do with me in the next season use this storm that you're in and know that God is still God and he has you in the hollow of his care Romans 8 and 28 says and we know not we think not maybe not might not perhaps and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. And we know, not maybe, not perhaps, and we know, we know it's working for your good. Use it. Use this storm. It's working for your good. God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. Thank you for reminding us that we don't have to be weary. Thank you for reminding us that you are our God who will lift us. Thank you that this storm is not to consume us, but it is to challenge us to go higher. 
Thank you for allowing us to use it for leverage and lifting. Now get the glory. Get the glory out of this moment. And open up our hearts and our minds that we might receive you in fullness. So that we can come through this season better than we went into it. Say it in the Lord rebuke you right now. The spirit of weariness, we're going to trade it for a garment of praise. You are a lie. We will be what God says we are. And eyes have not seen. Ears have not heard. It has not even entered into the heart of men the things that God has in store for us. We will have everything God promised. And we don't have to wonder. We know all things are working for our good. And now, God, if there be man, woman, boy, or girl here under the sound of my voice that, that does not know there's an eagle locked inside of them, they've been hanging out in low places when you made them to be seated in high places in Christ Jesus. Take this moment, God, to transform their hearts and their minds so that their eternity can be solid and secured in you. Let them know that you called them here to listen to this word for a purpose. And that purpose will be manifested and revealed as they continue to forge ahead in you. Convict, convince, convert, challenge, and equip them. In Jesus' name. If you're here today and you want to receive Christ, you want to take your wings and throw your wingspan out so that he can lift you the higher heights, it takes one thing takes you receiving Christ as your Savior. What are you waiting on? God's got some incredible stuff in store for you. What are you waiting on? You are an eagle. You are not a chicken. You're not a pigeon. You're not a crow. You're not a vulture. You're an eagle. And God says, I'm waiting to show you what you really have the capacity to do. If you want to pray this and you want to receive Christ for the first time, pray this prayer with me. Lord, thank you for this day and for saving my life. For this moment, I admit I've made some mistakes, but I'm so grateful that you continue to forgive me. I believe that you were born, that you died, and by faith, I believe you were raised from the dead. So with this confession, I'm excited to say I am saved. I'm so excited and proud for you. Come on, everybody. Praise God all over the room here. Praise God. Hallelujah. God, I ask for your grace upon them. I ask for your mercy to abound in them. Order their steps and lead them where they need to go and get the glory out of their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Use it. Don't run from it. Use it. We're in it. Don't grow weary. God's got you. Use it. Until next week, God bless you.